this butterfly has woken after its winter hibernation in a corner of my house. The two bronze pointers look on impassively. It's a characteristic of all living things that they react to stimuli. And this butterfly's behavior has been triggered by the increase in day length and the rise in temperature that comes with the spring. These puppies have had their predatory instincts aroused by the sight of another fluttering butterfly. The game of chase has a function in teaching them how to use their bodies. It awakens their senses and hones their reflexes. That's Blackie and Henry in the background. There's Erin on the left and Solo. The older dogs enjoy a chase when they're out at exercise too. This time it's the swallows that run the gauntlet. But the dogs know when to be serious. When they're out hunting, their minds are on game, and the swallows are forgotten. The swallows fly all the way from Africa to nest in my kennels. Although they're flying in and out every few minutes, just inches above the dogs' heads, the dogs don't pay them much attention. So the dogs' behavior will be governed by the situation. They chase the swallows out in the field, ignore them when they're hunting, and pay them little attention in the kennels. So if you want your dogs to respond, don't forget to vary the training location. We can learn a lot just by watching dogs. We don't always understand what's going on, but often we can use the natural tendency of the dogs. Here, Henry, the eight-month-old puppy, seems to enjoy rolling over and allowing Sandy, an 11-year-old, to sniff him all over. And then he does a bit of sniffing on his own account. We don't know why this happens, but it's behavior that we can use. Come here. Come here. Come here. Come here. Come here. In Britain, trainers have been controlling dogs with the sit for many hundreds of years. If you put a dog in the flat down position, you have it under complete control because it can't do anything. So our dogs have been bred to be rather sensitive to accept this form of suppression. Sit.
On your feet. Here, civil. Civil. There are many similarities civil. between the work Here. and training of sheepdogs and the work and training Here. of pointing dogs. Here. The stalk of a sheepdog is very similar to the Here. point of a pointing dog. On your feet. And notice how the handler is using the sit Done. to control his dog. Done. The sheepdog's natural tendency is to go around the flock and try and stop it escaping. And this is controlled by training so that the dog will move either clockwise or anticlockwise closer to the flock or further away. The number of commands seems to be very confusing, but there are in fact just a few basic commands and an infinite variety of grey areas between those commands. In this way, the dog can be controlled with great delicacy and finesse. That's a wild goose. Pat McGettigan, who's handling these dogs, picked the goose up as a gosling on the road, and he put it in amongst his Indian runner ducks that he uses to train his dogs. So the goose now thinks it's a duck. Pat's handling five sheep dogs in an attempt to drive the Indian runner ducks through his outstretched legs. The ducks move off when the dog comes within what is called an escape distance. They don't feel comfortable with the dog that close, so they move off in an attempt to increase what is called the escape distance. There's a parallel here with the work of a pointing dog. The pointing dog will locate game by the air scent and it can only do this if it comes within the scenting distance. If the escape distance is greater than the scenting distance, then the bird will fly off. This is why it's always a good idea to give a young dog the benefit of working on birds which are more inclined to lie to a point. In other words, we train on paired birds in the spring and on broods during the summer and then gradually increase the degree of difficulty so that the dog learns to handle the birds as they become wilder. Now look at the, di the most distant dog here. See the saliva dripping from his lips. There's no doubt at all what's going through his mind. And he's done it. And now that's all over, the goose comes back. Although he thinks he's a duck, the wild ancestry decrees that he has a larger escape distance than the ducks, and so he flies off to avoid a confrontation with dogs and humans. And just to show that these dogs are not just circus performers, there they are in their everyday work of working a flock of sheep on the farm. I'm sad to say that since this film was made, Pat McGettigan died of a heart attack. I lost a good friend, and Scotland certainly lost a very good sheepdog handler and trainer. If you remember from the pointing instinct, we used the sit to control dogs at that critical moment just after birds are flushed.
when they could conceivably chase. Here's a young dog that would like to do just that. The bird's flushed, he'd like to chase, but the sit takes priority. And we use the sit just to control the dogs and bring them under subjection when we need to call them in or do something else. The best age to teach a puppy to sit is probably about three or four months of age. The first task is to get the puppy into the correct position and to show it that it is perfectly safe and secure when it's down in the flat down sit position. That is flat down with the chin on the ground. Notice how I'm using my left hand here to caress the puppy when it's in the correct position and scratch its ears and I'm using my right hand with a check cord to just pull the head back down when it tends to rise. There's no great mystery about a check cord. It's just a very strong piece of light cord with a running noose on the end. A dog should never be attacked when it's in this position. This is safety and we want to make it feel comfortable Seed. and secure. Seed. 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 You'll proceed a lot faster with this job if you get the timing right. The dog only gets a reward when it's in the correct position and the cord is tweaked to just forestall when it starts to bring its head up. And by Keeping tension on the cord, I can back off and start sit. to use a hand signal. Sit. 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 It takes quite a lot of patience sit. and persistence to train setters. Sit. Getting them to go down is rather like pushing a cork down in a bucket of water. Sit. But you get there in the end, just sit. kind persistence and reward. The line of pointers I have are very, very soft and you have to be very careful not to upset them. I'm just steadying this one with light pressure with my knee and we can see why it continues to bring its backside up from the ground because its feet were not in a comfortable position. And as soon as they're readjusted, a little bit of stroking and the puppy relaxes. Sit. 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 The pointers seem to go into a sort of hypnotic trance. Sit. 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 You'll notice that I continue to repeat the command sit. This is so that the dog associates the word with the position. The words used in dog training often do not follow human logic. They are used to convey a message to the dog. And see how this pup has woken up and is now ready for a game. This is a completely different kettle of fish. This little pup is just a bundle of life and she's convinced that we're having a good game here. But with gentleness and persistence, even this pup can be taught to drop in just a few minutes. When she's in the correct position, she gets her ear scratch, which is a very, very powerful tool. Sit. You're a Wrigley. 
You're a wriggly person. Yes, you are. You're a wriggly little person. You're very wriggly. We'll try again. Sit. Sit. Get her into the correct position. Sit. Sit. Get to work on those ears. Sit. This time I'll try a check cord. Sit. If you remember from the pointing instinct, we can do anything to puppies, but we must stop when they squeak in pain. The rough games they have will continue so long as one of the partners doesn't give a squeak. And a couple of little jerks on the check cord are sufficient to quieten this pup down. That's about as severe as you ever need be. Notice when she tries to bring her head up, just a quick t tweak on the cord is enough to stop the action. Now the next stage is to get the puppy to go down by itself in response to the command. This puppy doesn't seem to want to get up. This is Penelope. She's a rather small Llewellyn setter bitch. And she's not going to win any shows. But I've always found that this type of dog is extremely intelligent and usually very fast when they start to work. And I just tweak the cord. Sit. 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 And as a concession, she flops over as if she's pretending she's fallen over by mistake. That's typical set of behavior. I can gently draw her back with the cord. There's no escape. And then a little jerk on the cord and the command, and she decides she'll go down. And when she does, she gets a bit of petting as a reward. Sit. 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 And then we can gently start to introduce the come here by very gently tightening up on the cord and bringing her in. Down she goes again. Sit. Good girl. Sit. 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 And this gentle caressing is so relaxing, Sit. she goes to sleep. Sit. 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 Watch how I put the check cord on Erin. As he comes bounding up to me for a bit of petting, I pop the cord over his head and he doesn't even know he's got it on. Erin's been rather neglected over the winter because the weather's not suitable for dog training. Now I'm first of all going to take him through a few lessons on the sit. 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 You notice how the head keeps Sit. popping up. This is quite typical Sit. of the setters. Sit. 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 You may wonder why I'm insisting that the dog goes completely flat. That's Sit. because the early training will Sit. get eroded slightly Sit. when the dog begins to work. Sit. And it's better to have a dog Sit. complying totally at this stage and then allow it to lift its head later on when there are other more important things. If you get it right at the beginning, you have something to go back on. Now I've started to come here. Although Erin will rush up to me out of friendliness, he's got to learn to come when he's told. I've just tightened up on the cord and he's fighting it. Come on, puppy. Come on, puppy. 
He's not unduly distressed because you notice his tail is not tucked between his legs. And when he comes in, he gets the usual petting. I'm just tightening up on the check cord. I'm not hauling him in with it, just maintaining pressure. And when he does come in towards me, the pressure on the cord slackens off a bit. And the last few inches, I can just pull him in with a scruff of the neck. The first thing is to loosen the noose, because sometimes it can snag in the long hair of the setter. And then he gets a brief petting. Come here, come on, come here, come here. Try again. Come here, come on. When I tighten the cord, I am literally cutting his wind off. It's not very comfortable, but it doesn't cause any great pain. Try again, come and he comes in much come quicker this time. You notice that he seems quite relaxed when come he's here. beside me. Come here. He's not 100% relaxed, but we wouldn't expect that. But he's certainly not in come great here. stress. Come on. Come here. Come here. The time it takes come for him here, to come puppy. in come shortens here. every time. And deliberately filming this as one sequence so you can see how quickly the dog reacts if you do the training properly. Come here. Come here. Come here. Come here. Come on. Now he's going to try another ploy. He thinks that perhaps if he sits down, that will get him out of his difficulties. Come on, then. Come here. This confusion between commands is quite a common thing in dogs. It's just a misunderstanding, it's not disobedience, and we have to exercise patience. Now, from here on, I'll keep a piece of string in my pocket at all times. And if he has ever any hesitation in coming, I'll just put him through a couple of these lessons. By repeatedly calling a dog to you, uh, and have him refuse the call, you are merely training him to ignore the call. Now we've got the, the four pups that we saw earlier. Now Henry is a bit confused. He knows how to drop and he knows how to come here, but he can't tell one from the other. So we have to repeat, repeat. And I'll be using the two commands in the same exercise. He knows to go to sit, but then thinks that my body language, stooping over, although I'm saying sit, means he's to come here. If I go behind him, he can't pick up on my body language, and he stays in the sit position. Look at Blackie. He's responded to the command, although he's not the one being taught. Now we give Blackie some lessons. He's much better at it. And Henry in the background is looking a bit unsure of himself. Whilst maintaining contact with Blackie with a check cord, I can get Henry to lie down and then air in. Penelope's doing her own thing, but then she's a bit of a character anyway. Some dogs have got a tendency to wander off from the drop as soon as your back is turned. And my trick to cure this is to drive a number of pegs in the ground on the exercise field and then have a short cord which I can attach to the dog. This is just a short check cord tied to the peg. Sit. 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 Yes, and that's what I thought was going to happen. Sit. 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 I'll do this over several days and then the dog will eventually be convinced Sit. that there's no point in trying to move because he can't move.
We've even got Penelope to sit. Don't forget the ear scratch when they're in the correct position. And sometimes, when it looks as if you're losing, you'd better just pretend you weren't fighting the battle anyway. If you always treat your dogs with consideration, you can do all sorts of things to them. They trust you implicitly. Penelope rather likes being up here. And it's a great thing for a cold day. We all want what we can't have. And we've been training our dogs to retrieve by this method for a very long time indeed. What we're doing is awakening the dogs predatory instincts. The old hat takes on the role of the fluttering butterfly. All we're doing at this stage is encouraging the dog to learn that having an object in its mouth is pleasurable. Henry is a passionate retriever. Blackie is not a, a natural retriever. And the setters will be natural retrievers, although they're probably better on game. If you have to take an object out of a dog's mouth, just gently press its lip up against its teeth and push your hand in its mouth and prise the jaws apart. It can be done very quickly and without causing any pain. Now, I'm sharpening up on Solo's sitting. I'll repeat, repeat, repeat until the actions become automatic. He's being told to sit, and then he's called to me, told to sit, called to me, told to sit, called to me. And I'll go over and over and over until he does it without even thinking about it. When you, get your, you can get your dog to respond like this, you can start to increase the distance. And it becomes a sort of game, like the game of grandmother's footsteps we used to play when we were children. I'm doing exactly the same thing here with Solo, teasing him with the, the old hat to get him to take it in his mouth. Notice how he won't go down until I start to increase my height. So if you have a timid dog that won't come to you, you can l lower your height, you can stoop, or even lie down on the ground. De the delivery of the dummy is very bad at this stage, but I'll show you how to improve on that later on. Here's a young bitch. She's about 12 months old, the same as Solo, and she prefers the clean hat off my head to the dirty one that I'm asking her to retrieve. And it's just a game. She runs off with it in the hope that I'll chase her to try and take it away from her. And because I refuse to do that, she brings it back. Whenever a puppy brings me some object in its mouth, I scratch its ears and I might very gently take the object from it and then immediately give it back. Blessy, blessy, blessy. 
I'm going to give Blackie some more exercises in the retrieving because he's been sold for export and the new owner wants him to be partly trained when he leaves the country. A rolled up sock makes a great object to start a young dog on retrieving. And I think the smelly ones make the best. Here again, I'm just encouraging him to pursue what appears to be the live object. At this stage, probably two or three retrieves are quite enough. The last thing we want to do is to sicken him off retrieving. Now you see, I'm scratching his ears because he has the object in his mouth and he's brought it right up close to me. He's been encouraged to come up close for this ear scratch and now he's got the object in his mouth he gets the reward so long as he retains a hold on the sock. If he drops the sock, I immediately stop the ear, ear scratch. So we have him dropping perfectly. We'll hone up on that until it becomes absolutely automatic. We've worked on his coming to call, and now he's learned to pick up and bring back an object. The next stage is to put all these behaviours together so that he will be held in the sit position for a few moments when the object is thrown and then for his patience he'll be allowed to run out and pick it up and bring it back. Gradually over a few weeks with perhaps two or three retrieves a day the retrieves will be made more and more difficult and he will be asked to remain sitting for longer periods, so he becomes more patient. You see here, he's got the object pushed right up towards me, and he's had the ear scratch as a reward. A lot of trainers tell me that they can't train their pointing dogs because they have no game. Well, this season I find myself in a similar position. I've had a bad rearing season and I haven't got many birds to spare to train my dogs on. So I'm going back to my good old standby of the pigeon. I have an arrangement with a local grain processing company and I'm allowed to put my traps on the roof of their warehouses. I can catch all the pigeons I need. If I wasn't able to do this, I would form an alliance with a local pest destroyer or perhaps with some local pigeon keeper. The pigeons are very useful bird to train dogs on because they seem to have a gamey smell. But don't try and fool old experienced dogs. What we do is to dizzy them. We put the head under the wing and gently rock the bird to and fro and then provided the bird is laid on the side that its wing is at, its head is under it'll remain like that for several minutes and as soon as the weight is taken off that side the head comes out and the bird wants to fly Don't forget that any dizzied bird has an escape distance of zero, so the dog can just walk up and pick it up. So whenever using dizzied birds, you must use a check cord on the dog to stop it from getting hold of the bird. The correct way to plant pigeons is to wipe them on the grass and then put them, after you've dizzied them of course, into a tuft of grass. Here's Penelope. She's a bit confused at being on the check cord and she wonders what on earth is going on. 
I've got a long stick to wake the pigeon up. I shall give it a gentle poking. And the pigeon is in, just in front of the camera by that little yellow flower. The breeze is going from the camera, from the pigeon, towards myself and the dog. Penelope doesn't seem to have any idea that there's a pigeon there because she hasn't yet learnt to use her nose. But look at the transformation that takes place when she realises that there's a bird there. And because she's got no chance of catching the pigeon, I can check the, take the check cord off and let her chase. Unrewarded behaviour will be abandoned. Rewarded behaviour will be continued. This is a pigeon launcher. The pigeon is gently held in a fold of cloth. And when a trigger is pulled, the bird is thrust forcefully up into the air. I'm not very fond of them because they make a rather loud noise which could frighten a young puppy. Also, a dog could get struck by one of the arms. But worst of all, they have to be triggered by a long string which can get snagged by the dog and the pigeon can be released at the wrong moment. And my foot has caught the string and the bird is gone. You can get radio controlled pigeon releases and they might have some use. Back to the pups and let's see how we progressed. Now, I'm deliberately tempting the, the dogs off the drop. They've been told to sit, but I reduce my height, which is very attractive to them. And the object here is to teach them that the sit must take priority. And I can use the check cord to control the pup at a distance. This time, I've got all the pups dragging check cords about four yards long. Penelope's got her head up. I can lift her check cord, just give it a tweak, and she knows she's got to go down. The trick to using the check cord is to use it as sparingly as possible, so that the dog is never quite sure whether it has it on or not. Here I'm removing the check cords. The dogs are not even aware what I'm doing. And then, because they've behaved well, we can have a bit of fun. I put my hat over my face to stop my face getting licked. This is the young bitch again. We've sharpened up on her, her dropping exercises and she's going down quite smartly. She's just got one small fold. She tends to turn round to look behind her when I put her in the sit position. As you'll see, she wants to see what's going on behind. Now I can stop this very simply by making sure she's comfortable, she's sitting properly, and then with a, a small stick, when she looks round, I can just give her nose a, a light tap. Don't forget that the dog must feel absolutely, absolutely secure in the sit position and so a light tap is all that's needed. I then tap the ground and wave the stick around her to convince her that it wasn't the stick that caused the slight discomfort. She's still quite safe provided she stays flat down and still.
By using the hand signals quite frequently, I can later dispense with the verbal commands. And I'll introduce whistle commands in exactly the same way. At first I'll use my mouth, and then I'll use a mechanical whistle. Every morning I have a ritual. As I have my cup of tea, I load the blank pistol. I'm using Turner Richard dummy launcher blanks. They're the long ones and they give a tremendous bang. This is the moment the dogs await with great eagerness and by using a shot to herald the beginning of their exercise period, they regard the, the, the shot as something very pleasurable. I also fire a, a couple of shots as I let the dogs out. They're not required to drop to shot at this stage. Don't forget that it depended on the situation. When I'm teaching the dogs to drop to shot, I raise my hand just as if I'm giving the hand signal to sit and fire off one of the short flanks. You must be very careful when introducing the shot that you don't introduce any unpleasantness. I use three whistles, a silent whistle, a straight whistle, and I have a referee's whistle which I never use. The signals are fairly standard amongst pointer and setter trainers. It's a long single blast for the drop and a series of short repetitive pips to call the dogs to you. When you're calling dogs to you, you can slightly reduce your height to encourage them to come in or walk away Turn your back, walk away across their line of vision, vision and they will think you're going to leave the scene and they come much faster. Of course, you never call a dog to you and do anything unpleasant to it. Hugh Haggerty, the falconer, has brought his two-year-old German wirehead pointer over to me because it's not pointing yet and he's getting a bit worried. I've explained that I think we should get the dog pointing in right, 15 or 20 to... minutes. How many are you putting out? I don't think he believes me. Right. My technique to do this is to lay a line of dizzied pigeons about three or four metres apart directly into the wind. So the wind will be blowing down the line of pigeons and in this case is blowing into the camera lens. Joe, Hugh's partner, is giving me a hand putting out the pigeons. We dizzy them, rub them on the grass, and then pop them in a tuft of grass with a weight on the side that the head is under. It depends how you dizzy them. If you get a bit of experience, you can actually dizzy them so that they fly off almost immediately. Then the technique is to bring the dog up to the first pigeon on the lead and to flush it using the stick in front of it. Now, if he'll chase, just let him chase. Just drop the lead. Watch the dog's behaviour. It's definitely rather curious of what's going on. It keeps looking back to Hugh for some sort of clue, and his tail is wagging in a rather haphazard manner. He pauses as the pigeon flies off and looks back for some sort of clue from the human participants. Very gently and slowly we can move on to the next pigeon. Look at the tail wagging now. It's wagging much faster. The dog seems to be more interested in what's going on ahead, although he still looks back occasionally for some clue from the humans. Do you normally sit in when, when 
Always take your time and take the initiative from the dog when using this technique. It's what I call a process of realization. We want the dog to associate the scent with the bird and to let him realize that he can discover the bird upwind by scent alone. Everything's going smoothly. The dog is sniffing the ground where the pigeon was and occasionally looks back to the humans or looks forward to where the pigeon flew off. Don't forget to check the wind occasionally because the wind can change direction. Now we're coming to pigeon number three. The attitude of the dog is very different. And he's on point. He's stiffened up and there's no doubt at all that he's pointing the pigeon. Hugh still maintains control with the lead, but he has allowed a little bit of slackness in it so that the dog is definitely in command of the situation and pointing. Hugh gently strokes him and talks to him to let him feel confident. You could at this stage, if your dog has been trained well enough, get it to drop to wing. But that's not essential. We simply want to get the dog to point. Now the dog's whole attitude has changed. It's using its nose and it's hunting for game. To get some idea how scent behaves, we can light one of these plumber's smoke bombs, which are used for testing drains. It's a cold, still, frosty day, and there doesn't appear to be any wind at all. Yet the smoke fans out from a point source into this cone, which gives some idea of why we talk about a scent cone. On a windy day, the situation is very much more haphazard. And you can imagine a dog catching a whiff of scent, perhaps on the left-hand side of the picture here, and then the breeze taking it away again so that the dog gets a breath of scent which then disappears. It must be very confusing for a young dog. Look at Penelope here. She just hits that scent. You can see the bird in the foreground and she comes to an abrupt halt. I've got her on a cord because, of course, I'm using dizzy birds and I don't want her to catch one. Erin has hit scent and now looks confused. He goes to the left and then to the, his right and he hits the scent again. And he's quite definite. The longer you allow a dog to point like this, the more staunch they will become. And in the bad old days, we used to sit down in the heather with our dogs, perhaps put the loop of the lead over a foot and have a cigarette. I'm just waking up this, this bird because I want Erin to stalk forward under control. What I'm trying to do is to build up the communication between myself and the dog. I want him to walk forward, but in a steady, controlled manner. Because many of our game birds will run in front of the dog. And they must learn to be able to handle this situation. Blackie is a different kettle of fish. He is perhaps a bit too staunch. He's got a very good nose and he's very intense on point. Now look what happens when I start to flush this bird. He's already been taught to drop to wing. And as the bird flies, he drops down. Oh, what a clever boy. 
What a clever boy. What a clever boy. You he's clever. Isn't he clever? Penelope, on the other hand, is still at the pounce stage. She wants to rush in and grab the bird, but I'm stopping her with a check cord. It generally takes longer to train setters, but then they're more intelligent. Erin has got a very firm point on a planted bird. And what I've done here is to lightly dizzy the pigeon so that we hope it'll flush and I can give him an exercise to drop to wing. If I was using a pigeon releaser here, there's a likelihood that he would learn to drop to the thump of the releaser rather than the flushing of the bird. We want the trigger to be the actual flushing of the bird and for this trigger to provoke the drop to wing. Now watch his body language. He's absolutely rigid on point at the moment and I can mess him about and stroke him and fiddle with his tail and he doesn't even notice. The longer you take over these exercises and the more patient you are, the more patient the dog will become. What we are attempting to do is establish short patterns of behavior. Now watch him. He moved very slightly, so I take up the slack on the cord, and he would have chased when the bird flushed if I hadn't been prepared. But instead, I give the cord a little jerk and tell him to sit, and he goes into the sit position. Now, this will be repeated and repeated until he does it automatically without being told. Penelope is at last pointing, but that's no guarantee that everything will go well. I'm trying to move her slightly across the wind because I don't think she's in the center of the scent cone. And she takes this as a trigger to go in and grab the bird. I'm just going to take hold of the scruff of her neck so she won't hurt herself if she does take a dive. And using my long stick, I'll wake the pigeon up and it flies off. And we've definitely made progress because Penelope makes absolutely no attempt to chase the pigeon. Look at Blackie again. He's really getting very good. He's dropping now in anticipation of the bird flushing. Dogs are very good at anticipating events. Blackie's reached the stage where he really needs some birds killed to his points. But it's the closed season and we don't shoot planted pigeons. I'm going to go in and catch the pigeon and humanely break its neck. I've killed it, but while it's still fluttering, I bring it back to Blackie and allow him to pick it up with his mouth. Now I'll walk off, he'll be reluctant to leave me and he'll be reluctant to leave the pigeon. He's already been trained to retrieve, so we get a perfect retrieve. At this stage, I would let the young dog drag a cord because we know he can point and if he flushes a few wild birds and chases them, that's no problem. Very soon we'll have a finished product like Gary here, who's quartering a moor for red grouse down in the southwest of Scotland. <laughs> Bye. 
there we've got a point and a back. And the dogs are roading forward to get a positive location on a covey of red grouse. We've got the guns out either side. And I'll encourage them to go forward of the point about 20 yards from the dogs, one on each side. Then we all move forward together. Because our birds are inclined to run, the dogs will move forward with the handler to put up the birds. And there goes the covey, and we've got one down. The guns will reload, and the dogs will be required to work out where the birds were lying. There could easily be one or two stragglers left in the heather. The gun on the right is ready for another shot. Don points a dead bird, and I bring it back and show it to them. The red grouse really is the prince of game birds. It's this bird which has formed, helped form our pointers and setters. The English, Irish and Gordon setters and the pointer. It's a truly wild game bird and a delight to hunt. The pointing instinct was intended as an introduction to the use of pointers and setters in Britain. If you haven't seen it, I think you'll enjoy it, and it's a very good introduction to the, the sport. This is Don quartering on a moor near my house, and now he's got a point. And this is a young pointer puppy, pointing birds. Advi Dick, one of my Llewellyn setters and the youngsters coming on. You've seen Shadow before. You might also enjoy Grouse Hawking, which is a documentary on Henri Desmond, who comes to Scotland each year to fly his Jure peregrines at the Red Grouse. He uses English setters to find them. There's only so much you can show in a video, and there are a lot of things in a book that need to be shown with the moving image. You should be able to get a copy of my book, Pointers and Setters, from any good bookshop by quoting this number. <laughs>